per request from a viewer. This is no Ken and Barbie build a camper van video. This is what not to do. This van has several examples, so I just went ahead and bought this van so that I could tear it apart without insulting anyone. Uh, if you built this van, I'm sorry for what's about to be said. Lots of people have made the same mistakes. First thing not to do, don't build your permanent kitchen structure here hanging over the doorway without any kind of access because now this door handle is broken. This door panel is on the whole door and it's been there since before that cabinet was put in. So we're gonna have to either take the door off the van or rip the cabinet out just to fix that door handle. And also uh, that adjustment back there should be made every couple of years probably and there's absolutely no way to access that. So that's a problem. Next major common mistake, USB ports in your AC outlets. USB is a five volt outlet. This is 120 volts. Your van's running 12 volts. So in order to make this work, you're taking 12 volt battery, boosting it up to 120 volts to run the AC current. And then within this outlet box here, it's jacking it all the way back down to five volts DC. Uh, we're changing not just voltage, but electrical type there from DC to AC and back to DC. There's all kinds of conversion losses going on here. You're pouring energy down the drain to get a little trickle charge into your iPhone. Let's look in here real quick. Underneath here, those wires were not connected. I just started wiggling them and they fell off. This is not safe. This is not wired properly. If you don't know what you're doing here, no shame in that. Find a friend who can teach you how to do it. Have someone else do it. Or at the very least, have someone check it. Have a professional come out and check it when you're done because this is a mess. This is not only a fire hazard, but somebody's gonna get hurt. Uh, you go putting things in here like a camp stove, touches up against one of those wires. Now the camp stove is laying in here at 110 volts hot and somebody's gonna to touch that. Next problem I find right away with this electrical, I don't even know what the hell's going on here to be honest. Now I have turned it off, unplugged this, uh, this wire so that I'm not gonna get shocked messing around with it. Neutral isn't even wired to that outlet. It's only got, line and ground which obviously in a van is not a ground and over here to the switch i mean this is no way to make 110 volt connections now we've got all these bare wire connections more over here bare wire connections sitting right on top of a propane can uh, there is no floor venting there's absolutely no way for any leaking or off-gassing propane to exit the van. So, yeah, we pretty much built a bomb. Okay. Next thing everybody wants to do is put their refrigerator on a stupid slide-out drawer. Why? Now open the refrigerator drawer is a two-step process. You gotta slide the refrigerator out and then swing the door open. Hold the door open while you grab whatever you want. Set it on a counter if you can reach one. Close the door, close the slider. I mean, come on. On to the next problem. Here we have a drain from the sink coming down to a bucket. When that fills up with water, do you really think that's gonna stay put when we step on the brakes? This is a ground wire. What's it screwed into? Wood and styrofoam. So not serving its purpose, not a ground. Well, there's another one. You can tie your AC lines together and tie your DC voltage lines together, but don't tie your AC and your DC lines together. Uh, when two wires are run parallel for an extended distance at a close proximity, the energy from one can uh, transfer over to the other. What's that called? Induction. Uh, the induction of the 120 volt lines on your 12 volt lines can really cause some problems, especially if you've got any touch lights or dimmables. Uh, it's just a headache waiting to happen. So keep those two sources separated by a couple inches 
and do not put your cables in conduits. Wire in conduit rattles when you drive over bumps. There's nothing you can do about it. And the way we have to bend around the tight corners and such in a van, you're not really going to be able to shove a new wire through that conduit six months down the road. Uh, it's just, you know, I've seen too many people try it and it just doesn't work out. No conduits. Now, I'm probably going to get some flack over this one, but in my opinion, Romex should never be used in a van anywhere. It's solid copper wire, and if you bend it back and forth enough, it'll break. Uh, a cut-up extension cord, a heavy-duty extension cord, is much better wire, flexible, multi-strand wire. Uh, extension cords aren't the most highest quality wire, maybe, uh, but it's much, much cheaper than buying good wire by the foot and it works very well in the short distances we're running inside camper vans. So buy decent quality extension cords, cut the ends off and use that wire in your van. These ceiling lights are AC powered on an AC light switch plugged into an extension cord run on the inverter. Come on folks, LED lights take what three, five volts maybe? Six volts? Easy to wire into the 12 volt system, so you do not need to run the inverter to have lighting working. Inverters have power losses just in the conversion. So again, we're converting 12 volts up to 120 volts AC. Then probably somewhere in this lighting fixture, it's going to convert back down to DC for the LED. Let's see if we can get that out of there without breaking anything. So we'll be getting rid of those all together. Oh, hey, that's nice. And the Chinese diesel heater was so bad I couldn't leave it for a day. It was run up through the floor and then sitting on a shelf here where all of this pipe, the exhaust pipe, and this exhaust connection are all inside the van. No. The seal on the bottom of your Chinese diesel heater is intended to be the the wall between your indoors and your outdoors. Anything under this, I'm sorry, everything, everything under this red seal here should be outside of your camper van environment. You do not want that indoors, period. No more need to talk about that, right? All right, here's one thing I'm guilty of myself quite often. Well, you know, most of the things I talk about, I learned that they're bad because I did them once. Uh, in this van, we have just about every kind of wood imaginable. We've got some fir 2x4s over there. We've got some pine 2x4s, yellow pine, scab 2, the white fir. We've got cedar doors. Uh, what is this? White pickled oak paneling back here. Uh, oak butcher block. One row LED strip light. Sort of stuck to the back of that cedar board because, you know, glue on cedar, yeah, tape, it'll be fine. Paper towel holders. Pretty much a no-win situation. Put your paper towels on there. Every time you drive, every vibration and bump, the towels are going to unroll. You end up with a whole roll of paper towels unwound down on your countertop, in your sink, on the floor, wherever they go. If you put a chain over your paper towels or some kind of a little rope maybe that looks a little prettier that will keep them from unspinning unspooling while you're going down the road a couple minor issues here water pump first of all is probably upside down uh, maybe the manufacturer wants it this way but i install them normally at least unless i find instructions tell me otherwise so that if the water leaks it doesn't drip on the electrical part put the electrical part above the water also, this pump is mounted well above the tank, so it's going to have a hard time priming itself. Um, and it's mounted directly to a very large hard wall. So all the vibrations of that pump are being uh, sent into that wall, which essentially becomes a giant speaker. Mount that to something small, something soft, something inside a cabinet. These little cabinets aren't too bad. But somebody came through and ran a wire through them later. That's unfortunate. And we've got things like this sharp screw down here just 
poking into the cabinet. So be careful what you put in these cabinets. Might get a little torn up. All right, something they did right here. Yes, hot and cold faucets. Most of us use hot and cold faucets. A lot of people will just tap off or, or cap off the hot side. That is a very bad idea. We want to run water through the hot and cold side um, because the hot side capped off will let water stagnate in that capped pipe. Stagnant water causes Legionnaire's disease. Well, it can. And we don't want that, even if we're not drinking the water coming out of our tap, uh, you know, brushing our teeth, washing the dishes, whatever. There's just no point, no reason to have that potential contamination sitting there of stagnant water tied right next to your cold water supply. That's an awful lot of hose. Not a big deal. Now, in addition to all of this stuff, thunking and clunking around. Everybody seems to love these pull-out faucets. Pot fillers, I think you call them. They all have this weight hanging on them somewhere, so it retracts the, uh, the hose back into it. And you guessed it, thumpers and clumpers all the way down the road. What's gonna happen on a bumpy road? Wait a minute, that's not the least of our worries. On the outside we have some problems too. That solar panel's raised up just a little bit. Our roof deck is raised up just a little bit. Another solar panel raised up. How are you gonna clean on top of that? in between there. No, well, you're not, are you? So that's just gonna get all clustered up with uh, mildew and whatever and, and, and growth and eat the wax off of your paint and then eat your paint and then you're gonna have rusty roof underneath your solar panels. Those look like self-tapping screws to me. And what's that? Flex seal. Yeah, that'd be flex seal. So that's not doing its job. Rusty bits of angle iron. Never was painted. So that's just going to cause rust. Yeah, we've got all kinds of problems here. What do you suppose is living inside of those? One, I kind of like this little table over here. Unclips, it's a nice whiteboard, but it unclips and becomes a table. I would use a webbing strap rather than a chain there. It'll be a whole lot quieter and uh, more convenient for a lot of reasons. That strap webbing works really well for a lot of things. Just buy a ratchet strap and cut the ends off fold it over a knife and melt it with lighter to get the end to, so it doesn't fray. Uh, back doors, a lot of people want to put windows in your back doors, bad idea. You leave that window open, head up down the highway, and it's gonna suck in exhaust. Because of the beautiful aerodynamics of our van being so similar to a masonry brick, uh, everything that leaks out of the engine and drips at highway speed, gets caught up in the air and slammed against that back door. Uh, if you've ever had a bad oil leak, you know this is true. The back door gets slimy. And the same is true with all of your exhaust gases coming out. They hit that back door. If you've got an open window or a big leaking air seal like this, there's no rubber seal on this back door at all, that exhaust gas is coming in the van. Well, I'm going on about rubber door seals, they pull off and they push back on. It's super easy. There's just no reason to get paint all over them like that. So let's talk about fire extinguishers. Every van should have one. Every home should have one. Put it somewhere where you can get at it. Uh, yes, you're gonna see it. It's not a pretty 
thing necessarily. There's no rules against painting them. Go ahead, paint it, make it beautiful. But have a fire extinguisher somewhere so that you can use it on your way to the exit. You don't want it jammed in a back corner way back there so that you have to go digging through your luggage to find it when you need it. Uh, up here behind the driver's seat or even in the footwell past the driver's seat there is a fine place to mount one. We don't use the back couple inches of our footwell, so, uh, and that's a very convenient place to grab something in an emergency. So that's a good spot for it by the driver's footwell or the passenger's footwell too. Fire extinguisher, reachable. Just over the foot end of the bed, grab it. Insulated floors. As we can see here, this one's got a good inch of insulation, maybe more. That's actually, yeah, that's quite a rise here. This would have been the original top of the floor where the, uh, what, three quarter inch plywood, half inch only plywood set on top. So this floor is up a good two inches for insulation. So for comparison, this is that same hump. There's the factory floor. There's my carpet above it. Factory floor, yeah, there it is. So yeah, that's a little more than a half inch. So three quarters of an inch above that hump instead of three inches. With the carpet and everything, I'm maybe an inch above the floor. And I guarantee this floor is insulated just as efficiently, or effectively rather, just as effectively as that floor over there. Even in the coldest winters, we don't lose that much heat through our floors. And in the hottest summers, we don't gain that much heat through our floors. Yes, walking on a cold floor is uncomfortable for some people. Put a rug down. You're losing three inches of ceiling space there. I'm six foot tall. And as you can see, that is a problem. I can't, I'm barefoot and I can't stand straight up in this van, even at the fan. Anywhere else, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting my head way before I lock up my knees. So I'm standing with bent knees the whole time I'm in this van. It's uh, rather uncomfortable. Ceiling also. If you're someplace super arctic, yeah, sure. Okay, insulate past the ribs. Um, here in Florida even, I don't insulate past the ribs. I make it as thin as I can. This board is way too thick for me. Uh, a quarter inch board or thinner to make the ceiling uh, past the ribs is all I want to give me maximum ceiling height. The insulation lost two inches every four feet, really not a big deal. Paneling walls, sure, it looks fine. Uh, some of us are familiar with kill mat. It's made to take vibration out of large panels like this. That is a giant sound board right there. Every little bump in the road is just getting amplified by that. And then we've got some loose ones where it really gets to rattling. All of that is just road noise. It's going to drive you nuts. How to avoid it? Well, one way is uh, put something on your walls so it's not just a thin board like that. Something like this. It's just a thin paneling wall, but I didn't want it to be a soundboard. So I glued cloth to it. Kill mat would have done something similar to it, but that cloth is fine. It takes all of these uh, wall panels, putting cloth on them really takes the vibration out. Cabinet boards too. A little bit of cloth makes a huge difference. Carbon monoxide sensors, O2 sensors, alarms, whatever you want to call them, must have one. Every van should have one. But don't put it down at the floor. Read the instructions on the, the box that it came in. Most of them will tell you to put it at head level. Uh, one reason is because you want to be able to see it. You don't want to have to lay down on the floor to read the damn thing. The other reason is, where do you breathe? At your head. Where's the air most important? Where you breathe. It's not rocket science, folks. Putting that down on the floor is kind of okay, not optimal. You're not doing yourself any advantages by doing that. I want to talk more about noise here, fans. Normal fans with a big spinning blade. Never mind them being a little bit dangerous with long hair and close quarters. Uh, these little squirrel fit cage fans are quieter, safer, and move a whole lot more air. I think this was uh, 20 bucks on Amazon. 
Maybe I can find a link for that for you. Here's a pro tip for sprinter vans. Back handles out of the, uh, the back doors here make excellent coat rods and towel bars. Hook them to the ceiling, hook them to the wall. They're good to go. Getting back to Chinese diesel heaters, uh, I'm sure there's valid arguments for this, but I feel under the passenger seat is the best place for it. Let's swing around out here. In a T1N Sprinter, it can go all the way back, squeezed up pretty tight into that corner there. Uh, it's a very specific placement. So the intake and exhaust pipes straddle everything they need to straddle under here. It's a tight fit, but if you do it right, it's worth it. It's the safest place for that heater. Control wires need to be extended, so you can run them over here and reach them from the driver's seat. They are behind the driver, so you know, obviously don't try to work the heater while you're driving, but you can reach them without getting up, getting out. With respect to the size, sizing of the Chinese diesel heater, I found the five watt heater is just too big for a small van like this. Uh, on kind of cold nights, it gets hot, too hot. The Chinese diesel heaters don't turn off when the thermostat point is reached. They only turn themselves down to bare minimum. And sitting at bare minimum on a 50, 45 degree night where I just barely want the heat on, uh, it gets way too hot in here. So I have the remote control hung next to my pillow. That's a good workaround. I think the ideal situation is a two, uh, the, the two watt Chinese diesel heater. And since my next build is going to be for all seasons, I'm going to have two two watt Chinese diesel heaters. One up here in the front like this and another one in the back. That way, if it's too cold for one heater to keep up, I can turn on both heaters. Uh, if it's just moderate temperatures, I can turn on one small heater that will turn down much lower heat than the five kilowatt heater is. And if I have a failure on the Chinese diesel heater, I've got a backup diesel heater then, so I won't freeze to death no matter what. Lagoon tables, they're kind of wobbly, rather inflexible if you ask me, and expensive. Three quarter inch steel pipe from the hardware store, elbows, street elbows, and standard elbows. Um, let's see, and flanges, both for the wall and for the table. It works really well. Table spins, comes out away from the chair. That chair spins around uh, 180 degrees. The table is very flexible, just like a, a lagoon table, but a little bit better if you ask me, a little more sturdy. This one over here swings out this way. And there, that's the desk for that, that chair. And now it's a side table. The same pipe situation is what I use for my drink holder here with two 45 degree bends. You can make any angle you want so I can make that pole come straight up off of that floor that's not straight. There's a pipe flange underneath the carpet and it comes up, bends over, bends around, does some things. A couple more pipe flanges up top to hold a big round cup holder wine glass holder, soda can holder. So I'm not out of ideas, but as you can tell, the sun is set and I told somebody I'd make this video today, so I am all out of time. Tune in to Florida Van Man for more. We've got some events coming up that you don't wanna miss. Come join us at a Florida Van Meetup and uh, join our Patreon. Help make more of this happen.